If you have rental income, you can look at retirement a lot differently and you might be able to create way more income. I'm gonna show you an example. I'm also gonna tell you why I have clients that do this and don't do this. So if you don't already know, my name is Ari Taubleib. I'm a certified financial planner. I'm the host of the Early Retirement Podcast and I'm the vice president here at Root. Let me give you the simplest example and then let me actually show it to you. So someone came to me and said, listen, I don't know how much income I wanna spend in retirement, but..." but maybe a hundred, hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year. I said, Great, you can have a hundred percent in equities. They go, wait a second, I I'm gonna retire. I, I that seems a little risky. I go, Yeah, it's not good. They're like, then why'd you just say it? I go, Oh, you have rental income. So it's not good for your neighbor that doesn't, but you you have the ability to have way more in an aggressive part of the stock market because you have rental income bringing in a large majority of what you're living off of. If you did not have the rental income, you could not have this level of an allocation. They go, oh, okay, I get it. So the point here, I'm gonna show you a sample of a client of mine who actually has rental income and how it changes the planning projections. Why am I even making this video? Well, I'm making this video because you guys commented and asked me to. So please drop a comment on the type of content you're looking for and if this is helpful. So this comment comes from Muxi0121. Ari, do you have any episodes that include rental income in the portfolio? If not, can you make a video to speak on that and how to factor in rentals in the portfolio? That's all today's gonna be about. So if you have rental income or have considered even getting a rental property, this is going to be the video for you. Now, before I show you this, there's a lot that goes into rental income, into renting a property, into considering that. I'm not a real estate expert, but I do believe in return on hassle, and I'm gonna tell you an example of that. So, I told my client, I'm gonna give you two options. Option one, real estate, you're gonna own it. It's going to give you a total return, meaning both appreciation of the property and rental income, so call it dividends, call it cash flow, call it whatever you want. Combined, you're gonna make 12% on that property, or you could make 10% in the stock market. What would you choose? And they go 12%. I said, great. Then here's what's involved. Roofs are gonna leak, stuff's gonna go on, you're gonna be traveling, you're gonna be worrying about it. Is that worth it to you? And they said, yes. I said, great. You hire a manager, even after that, you're getting 12% return. Please, I'll tell them, keep that property. Then you have someone else I asked that to, and they said, you know what? Yes, there's a 2% difference. If that means I'm gonna have to work six or seven years longer, I'd rather have more of my rental property if you're telling me it's gonna do better for me. But if it's not, I really don't wanna worry about tenants and roofs leaking, and I'd rather take this other return, like the stock market, even if it's less consistent than real estate, because there's no hassle. I just like knowing it's gonna do what it's gonna do, and I don't have to worry about it. So I'll ask clients, what's your ROH? And they go, don't you mean ROI, return on investment? I go, no, what's your return on hassle? Because I want you to know, is it worth it? I like real estate. There are tremendous tax benefits from real estate. I personally have investments in real estate, but it doesn't mean it's right for everyone, and it's not me saying you need it or you don't need it. It depends what are you looking for. I'm also investing a whole lot less in a traditional retirement plan because I'm investing in the business. I'm a partner at the company, and I want to put my money in what's going to get me the most return, and that's going to be my business, that's gonna be what I'm doing, and it's gonna be the stock market. And I like the stock market because there's no hassle. I know it's gonna be volatile, I know it's gonna fluctuate, but I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to attend meetings. There are, there, there's no board meetings I have to go to. I'm not talking to customers. It's, it's Amazon and Netflix and Google all working for me right now. Then there's real estate, and real estate, if that's your passion, can be awesome. And I'm gonna show you how that comes into a potential retirement plan. So some people go, you hate real estate, you love real estate. I, I don't hate or love either. I love the idea that you are working, getting the most out of what you've worked so hard for. So let me show you an example. Here's a couple, and you can see they're 46 and 50 years old. I'll zoom in and make it better for you. 46 and 50, I just changed their names. Here's their assets. So in terms of investments, they have what I'll call the superhero account. It has $100,000 in it. Then they have a 401k that has $1.6 million and a Roth with 200,000. They own a home worth 1.2 million and they owe $430,000 on that. Side note, I've always thought it's weird when people say I own a home. I just think own a home doesn't mean own it outright. And so it's tricky when you're playing around with software or anything I'm gonna show you right now, you can 
purchase this software, go through my videos and optimize your early retirement. You can do all of that without working directly with us. So not perfect for everyone, but for those of you that want to manage your own money and do your own thing and don't feel the need for an advisor quite yet, I have my academy in the description. It's going to ask you, do you own your home? And when it asks you that, of course, you can say yes and then input the mortgage. It's confusing. Different softwares do it differently. So just FYI there. Now, this couple doesn't have any children. They're 46 and 50, and they are thinking about retiring at 55, but they, they don't really know. They're like, listen, we don't hate our jobs. We just want to know, hey, when can we both stop working? And they want to stop together. They wanted to spend $8,000 a month. That's what they wanted to spend, but they didn't really know. So they're like, hey, even trips-wise, they're like, we haven't actually vacationed a lot because we're so busy, but we think we're going to want to spend 10000 or fifteen, or maybe twenty, or maybe 30000 I said, let's just put this in here. 8000 a month, call it 96 a year, keep it easy at 100 plus 20000 on travel. That's $120,000. Well, if that's what they want to spend in retirement, they don't need to create $120,000 in retirement. You're like, why not? Well, today it's pretty simple. They make 140000 and 90000 so they're bringing in a good amount of income today. There will be Social Security in the future. But they're netting rental income of $40,000. So that means after taxes, they have about three properties. After taxes, they're taking home $40,000 a year. Now, this particular couple, they've shared with me many times, it's not worth it to them. There's one property they really like. They like the tenants. It's low hassle. And they might even want to live in it when they retire. But right now, they're like, listen, it's just these other two are not worth it. But I don't want to get killed in taxes by selling it. So what should I do? So we did a whole real estate conversation for that. For simplicity here, $40,000 a year is coming from rental income. So what that means is if $120,000 is what they want in retirement, $40,000 is coming in. That's $80,000 less that has to be generated from their portfolio so they can meet their living expenses. And that's the truth for the first, call it, 10 years of retirement. Then Social Security might be kicking in. So then all of a sudden, Social Security gets kicked in. You might not be spending as much on travel because your energy and health might not be at the same level. Could be close. But then all of a sudden, I want them to understand if 40000 is coming from rental income, it's not 40000 forever because they're going to get rid of those two properties. Now, when they get rid of the two properties, they now have income that can be generated through their portfolio. But what you need to understand right now is if you have a real estate property, what is the cap rate? What are you actually taking home from the property? Let me give you an example. Let's assume you have a property worth a million dollars and it's giving you $10,000 a year. I mean, that's the return you're getting on it, okay? That's the actual cash flow it's throwing off, just for simplicity. That would be a really bad return, but to keep it easy, that'd be a 1% return. So people go, oh, that's not very good. I go, that's not the whole story. It's 1% cash flow, but maybe the price of the home has appreciated where it's gone up by 5%. So 1% cash flow, 5% appreciation, 6% total return. Now, in the stock market, it, it is similar where you have dividends almost acting like rental income, and then you actually have the total return. So in life, you always want to know what's the total return. I've seen real estate properties that are amazing with cash flow. I mean, 8 9% cash flow. Amazing. And they're only going to appreciate by 1% or 2%. And so all in, we're looking at 10 11%. I then see portfolios that amazing dividend stocks, really yielding high, 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 but the return's not very good, I meaning it's not growing by a lot. They're almost saying, yes, let me take the dividend instead of the growth. Now, sometimes it's a mix of both, and that's my job to optimize for my clients, but I want you to always ask yourself, okay, Am I taking on this real estate property because I love the cash flow? Do I even know the appreciation on average it's growing by? Ask yourself, is this rental property worth it? Both return and hassle. That's what I would encourage you to do. Now, let's assume for simplicity's sake, this couple goes, oh my gosh, I changed my mind already. I love it. 40000 of rental income. I like having it. it. gives me something to do in retirement. It's kind of fun. I get to manage it. Great. 40000 of rental income. They need 80000 to come from somewhere. Well, let's fast forward into retirement for a second, and I'll show you what I mean. If we go to the cash flows page here, let's keep it really simple. So here we are today, 2024, 46 and 50. $270,000 is coming in the door. Now, their expenses looks a little crazy. Five hundred. You can ignore this, okay? They've got some big projects and stuff they were playing around with before I hopped in, and, and they let me use them as an example. And th th this is, you know, 
crazy stuff. They were dreaming, hey, do we buy an RV and do we go to the World Cup in 2026? And stuff that they're like, I just wonder, like, could we do that? So they would have to pull from their investments, which, of course, I didn't recommend. But they're wondering, do we sell a property? And th- there's more nuance here. So d- don't look at this. Um, in fact, 2025 is probably a better representation for you to understand what we're even looking at here. So here they are. Let's call it next year, 278000 because once again, adjusted for inflation, that's what's coming in the door. They're only spending 123600 every year. And once again, they're not retired, but let's assume they wanted to spend 20000 a year on travel additional today. So that's $143,000 that they need, plus they got to pay for taxes on all of this, and they're saving $14,000. So $235,000 is going out the door. So that's leaving. That's out the door. This is in the door. 278000 comes in. 235000 leaves. That's $42,000 that they can do whatever they want with. They can save more. They can spend more. They can do whatever they want. Let's now fast forward. Let's fast forward here and just humor me for a second. We're going to fast forward, and we're going to go all the way to 2053. You're like, why 2053? Well, that's when required distributions are going to start. And so here, their income is going to be 264000 You're like, wait a second, wait a second. 264000 I thought you said they're going to be retired. I go, oh, they are. You're like, then what do you mean? What's happening here? Well, what's happening here is they have rental income that's still growing for them, and they have Social Security. And the Social Security is growing over time. And all of a sudden, if we're looking at two Social Security benefits, and of course, I'm going to show you why I play around with this differently in a second. There's no reason in the future, they might have $264,000 coming in. And they're like, all right, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I told you I didn't need that. I told you I wanted 120 and maybe 20 on travel. So call it 140. I go, oh, I know. But the government doesn't care. And they're going to force you to take out more than you even need. You're going to have so much coming in, $640,000, and you're only going to need $200,000 because 140 adjusted for inflation. You're going to need $200,000 so you can do everything you want to do. In fact, you're going to need a lot more than that because we're going to have to pay a lot of taxes potentially on these big distributions. So 640 is coming in and 380 is leaving. They go, well, then this is good, right? I have 260000 left over. I go, that's not good. That's 260000 getting taxed at the highest marginal bracket. And if you're here, like me in California, it's very high. So I'm telling this couple, listen, you're in a good spot. You're on track to have to take out more than you even need. So if you know you are on track, and this is the question I ask my clients at the end of my real estate calls, I go, if you knew you'd be okay with the stock market, let's assume averaging 8% growth, Versus having real estate and potentially getting 10 or 11 or 12% growth, but you knew you'd be okay, what would you do? And some people go, you know what, I just like real estate. I understand it. I I don't want that to be my whole portfolio, but I like it for a portion of it. I'm really comfortable with this, and it doesn't take a lot lot of my time. I say, great, then stick with the real estate. Do a combination of strategies here. Other people go, I I just want to simplify I don't want to have this real estate property. I don't want to worry about the tenants. My kids don't want to worry about it. It's more of a hassle at this point. Well, what I would tell this couple, if that was you, I would say, you don't need to have it. Yeah, if it was generating $40,000 of extra cash flow and we knew it was doing way better than the stock market could do and way not that much work, I'd say, great, let's own it. What are we doing here? Absolutely. But more often than not, what I see is a real estate property would not do better than the stock market as a whole, and it is way more effort and energy on your part, which is taking you away from you personally making more money or spending time doing what's most important to you. So this is how I want you to think about rental income, which is if you have rental income, great. If we're going to sell a property, don't sell it all in one year. You want to space it out and minimize the tax consequence. And you want to go, wait a second, I've got rental income. So I have the ability to invest differently in my portfolio. And you do. So I'll give you my final example to simplify it. Let's assume you have $2 million and you have 40000 a year coming in from rental properties just to keep it easy. Okay. Well, 40000 is coming in and you want to spend 100000 a year. 40 is coming in you want to spend 100000 $60,000 needs to come from your portfolio. 60000 needs to come every single year to supplement the 40000 so you can meet your hundred. Great. Pretty simple. Now, what we want to do is go, well, how much should be in equities or fixed income? Well, traditionally, let's look at a 60-40 portfolio. If we're looking at a 60-40, and I'm just pulling up my calculator here, we're going to take 40% of the $2 million. Conventional logic says you need $800,000 
to essentially be in fixed income assets, stuff that's not going to be a super volatile. Well, eight hundred thousand dollars. That's a lot of money in fixed income. Now, it's not a bad thing, but that's a lot of money that's maybe not optimizing the growth for us. Eight hundred thousand dollars divided by the sixty thousand dollars that I said we need our portfolio to generate. You have thirteen years worth of living expenses in that portfolio. So that person, I would argue, doesn't need eight hundred thousand of potential fixed income. They might be able to have four hundred thousand of fixed income, and maybe the the remainder. So if four hundred thousand of a portfolio, let's call it you know twenty four percent is in fixed income. The remaining 76% can be growing for them because we don't need that. It's allowing us to grow even further. Now, let's assume there is no rental income. If there's no rental income and you need 100000 a year, $100,000 a year, well, we need to make sure that you can supply that. So I would need a minimum of 500000 in super safe assets, a minimum, so that we don't have to potentially sell something at a loss and that's how we're going to get our income. So I want you to understand this cookie cutter approach does don't use any cookie cutter 60 40 70 30 80 20 depends how much you want to spend how much do you need in retirement how much would you love to spend not what could you get away with how much would you love to spend so rental income can be amazing it's an important factor if you have it in your plan great um, I want to make sure it's not taking more time or hassle from you I want to make sure that you're getting a good return on it and finally I want to make sure you understand is it something that if you do want to sell, you're being strategic as to the years you're potentially selling it because you don't want to overpay in taxes just to reduce hassle, which I've seen as well. So that's what I want to go through today. If you want access to this software that I just showed you when I play around with rental income and cash flows and all of that's accessible to you, even if you're not a technical root client, you can get our academy. You can see it in the description and you can purchase that today. Now, if you want to work with us one-on-one, -on -one, you can see, you can apply to work with us, and there's a wait list at the moment, and we will, of course, let you know if we feel we're a good fit and reach out sooner if possible, but right now, you can go and book a new call with us, and we're excited at the opportunity to work with you. So that is it for today. As always, hopefully this video is helpful. If so, please share it with someone that you think might find value in it, and like this and comment below, and let me know what you'd like to see more of in the following videos. Thanks, guys.